Well, as I uh, said that we were going to do, we are continuing in our series, Prophecies of Messiah Yeshua, and this is part two. Um, part two of the series, but... It's part one of a topic that we are going to be dealing with. In other words, I couldn't give you all of the information today, so we're going to do part of it today and uh, part of it next week. And it has to do with uh, Bereshit, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is December 1st, 2012 on our calendar here in the United States and the 17th of Kislev, 5773 on the Hebrew calendar. One of the things that has been a topic of conversation and debate has been um, this particular passage. And there's, there's a lot of theories out there as to who the Nephilim are and how they came to be and you know all, everything surrounding the mystery surrounding the Nephilim. Let's start off by reading these verses. So this is uh, Bereshit, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, In time, when men began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Adonai said, My spirit will not live in human beings forever, for they too are flesh. Therefore their lifespan is to be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the ancient heroes, men of renown." The wording of this, I mean, throughout the entire four verses, the wording them itself can cause some confusion. So we're actually going to be dealing with this verse by verse and talking about some of these things. In verse 1, one of the theories about this particular passage is that this is speaking about the difference between the Sethi and the Kayani. In other words, the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain or Cain. Okay? And so one of the teachings is that when it's, it's talking about the sons of God... It's talking about the descendants of Seth. And when it talks about the daughters of men, it's talking about the descendants of Cain. Okay? And so this particular theory or idea basically pits these two family groups against one another and, and says that the Sethi are the godly, is the godly line or the sons of God, and the Kayani are the ungodly line. Okay? 
And uh, the reason why this particular argument is raised is because if we start talking about the alternative, it becomes very troublesome. And people have developed certain ideas and certain uh, presumptions in regards to this particular issue that may not necessarily be true and that's one of the things that those are the things that we want to talk about today or at least begin talking about okay and so what we want to start off with is defining some of the words here because that that's basically what it boils down to we have to look at what the Hebrew actually says and define the Hebrew words that are used here. It's not good enough for us to look at these four verses just using the English translation because translation, when men sit down to translate from one language to the other, to another, uh, and we've talked about this before, what we have today has actually gone through four translations. Okay? Uh, in, in this case, three translations. But the, the Brit Chadashah has gone through four translations. It went from Hebrew to Aramaic to Greek to English. And each time that you make a transition, a translation from one language to another, there are things that you lose simply because one language will contain ideas and concepts and the next language that the language you're trying to translate into may not contain those things and so the whoever's doing the translation if and we're speaking the ideal and the most noble okay they will attempt to do the best job that they possibly can to try to get the idea across to the people speaking the language that they're translating into even though they don't necessarily have that concept in their language okay in some other cases that are not so noble people actually purposely translate a certain way because that's the way they believe and they're trying to uphold their belief okay it may not necessarily if you look back at the original language may not even say what what they translated it as saying and we're going to run into that in this passage, okay? So the word, the first word that we need to deal with here is the word men. Because it says the daughters of men. This particular Hebrew word just simply means mankind okay it's a very generic word it's not specific so if you're trying to support this whole idea of the Sethi against the Kayani both the Sethi and the Kayani are men they're part of mankind so there's nothing in this word that would differentiate between those two groups of people. When it says daughters of men, it just said, means daughters of mankind, humankind. Okay? The word daughters here, used in this particular statement, daughters of men, is the word banot. And again, this is a non specific word. It just simply means females, okay? Banot would be B apostrophe N-O-T, banot. And it just means females, okay? So this statement, the daughters of men, means females of humankind, Okay, that's simply all that it's saying. But it's important for you to know that in order to understand what's being said here. 
Now let's move on to verse 2. So verse 1 is in time when men began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them. Verse 2, the sons of God. The term here that's used in Hebrew is b'nai, B apostrophe N-E-I, Elohim. B'nai Elohim. So Elohim is E-L-O-H-I-M. And I want to take you to some other passages first before we actually define this term or talk about who the sons of God are. Let's go over to Eov, to Job. We're going to go to chapter 1, verse 6 to begin with. Job, yeah, oh, the page number, oh, sorry, I didn't understand what you were asking me, yeah, 993 in the complete Jewish Bible, chapter 1, verse 6, it happened one day that the sons of God came to serve Adonai, and among them came the adversary, Hasatan. Okay. Then let's go over to chapter 2, verse 1. Another day came when the sons of God came to serve Adonai, and among them came the adversary to serve Adonai. Chapter 38, verse 7. Now with those, you might be able to make some assumptions, but this one is much more plain. Let's actually start with um, verse 6. This is where God is addressing Eov and is asking him some questions. Where were you? Questions. Okay. Verse 6 says, on what were its bases sunk? Let's, let's start with verse 4 so we get the whole picture. Where were you when I founded the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Do you know who determined its dimensions? Or who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together... And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now this is clearly talking about God is asking Eov, where were you? And this is, a, this is not a question just meant for Eov, but for all human beings. Okay, He is addressing Eov personally, but this book was compiled and put in our Bible as a message to all of us as human beings. Okay? And God is asking the question, where were you human when I did all of this? And so this is talking about a time period pre-human being. Okay? And yet, he says, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, if this is pre-human beings, and these are not human beings that we're talking about. Who are the sons of God? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. According to these passages and others in the scripture, which use this same term, son, term sons of God, Sons of God does not refer to the Sethi as opposed to the Kayani. Sons of God refers to the angels. In this case, 
fallen angels. Okay? And we see in, this, in these two passages in chapter 1 and chapter 2 that of, uh, of um, Eof, that it says that the sons of God appeared before God in the throne room and with them came Hasatan, the adversary. Okay? So these are, this is clearly talking about angels. So we are looking at a combination between human females and male angels. Now this is difficult for us because it flies in the face of some of the preconceived ideas that we have as human beings about angels. And what I want you to understand is there's no record, if we're talking about two races of human beings, if that's the way you're going to try to explain this, there is no record of daughters of God marrying sons of men. Okay? So this does not mean godly versus ungodly, as some have tried to say that it means. And obviously, God went out of his way to put this section in the Bible. You understand, this could have been left out. And it wouldn't have affected anything as far as what we believe today in regards to Yeshua being the Messiah and all that kind of stuff. However, I told you last week that at the end of my message that this week we would be talking about how Hasatan tried to stop the Messiah from being able to be born. This was a plan by Hasatan to taint mankind's genetics so that the Messiah could not be born, so he could not come forth. And what the it's very clear from the fact that this is added in here that God is recording something unnatural and unusual that is happening. Okay? If indeed we were talking about just human men marrying human females, that's not there's nothing about that that is unusual. That happens all the time. Okay? So the reason that God recorded this in the scripture was to let us know something unusual is happening here that you need to know about. Now some people argue, again, the whole it's humans and humans thing by employing Matityahu, Matthew, chapter 22, verse 30. This is Yeshua speaking. So, Matityahu, Matthew, chapter 22, verse 30. Yeshua says, For in the resurrection, neither men nor women will marry. Rather, they will be like angels in heaven. Okay? And so, because of what Yeshua says here, the people who are speaking against the possibility of this being angels mating with humans, they say God, I mean, uh, Yeshua says in the New Covenant Scriptures that angels don't marry one another. Okay? Well, that's true. Angels don't marry one another. They don't marry one another in heaven. That, that's the first point that we need to bring forth. 
Yeshua says, just like they don't do in heaven. Okay? The situation that occurs in Bereshit, in Genesis, is something that occurs on the earth, not in heaven. Okay? That's the first point. The second point we need to make is that angels are never, in the scripture, angels are never declared to be sexless. Which is a preconceived idea. There's two preconceived ideas that are prevalent today. That angels are totally sexless or that there, that there are male and female angels. And in fact, one of the major movements that is going on right now was the result of someone saying that they were visited by a female angel. Okay? I, I am going to argue that that person did not have an encounter with a female angel. There is not one passage in the Bible where angels are ever referred to in the female gender. Every angel that you ever see in the scripture is male. This is therefore the other reason why there is no marriage of angels because they're all male. Okay? So, the question, the next question that begs to be asked is why did Hasatan have fallen angels intermarry with human females? Well, as we spoke last week in Genesis, in Bereshit, 315, God gives a prophecy about the Messiah, the one who would crush Hasatan's head, that he would be specifically the seed of a woman. Okay, remember we talked about how that was so different than all the other genealogies in the Bible. All the other genealogies are based upon male male-to-male -male descendants and how in this particular case God goes out of the way to say seed of the woman. So this was an attempt on Hasatan's part to corrupt the seed of woman. Okay? <clears throat> because Hasatan wanted to cancel this prophecy that God had given. Now the result of this particular attempt is found in verse 3. It says, Adonai said, My spirit... Now I'm going to read what how... Stern translates this verse, and then we're going to talk about what it really says. I, I'm actually very disappointed in Stern in this, partic this particular verse. Adonai said, My spirit will not live in human beings forever, for they too are flesh. Therefore, their lifespan is to be 120 years. That is not what this passage says. The King James Version has it better, and maybe some of the other versions, if you're using a different version, might also translate this in a, in a better way. This does not mean, or it's not, should not be translated, live in. It does, the word, the Hebrew word that is used here, yadon, comes from the Hebrew word din. And it does not even contain the meaning of live in. 
Okay? How many of you have ever heard the term Beit Din? Beit Din. Yeah. House of Judgment. Whenever there is a dispute in Jewish synagogue life, in other words, if a, if a, a congregant of a synagogue brings an accusation against the leadership of the synagogue, then the leaders that are above that particular rabbi, like in our case it would be the UMJC, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, we would call upon the UMJC to form a Beit Din. They then would bring three or four men together who would come to our location as arbiters. They would seat, seat themselves in judgment and both parties would submit themselves to what, whatever judgment they would rule. Okay? That is a bait den. Okay? House of judgment. So, this uh, bait den or bait deen, this word deen means judgment, it means to contend with, it means to strive with. Okay? So, what God says in this passage, and the, like I said, the King James Version has it right. King James Version says, My spirit will not always strive with man. Okay? It has absolutely nothing to do with living in man. Okay? So, God says in this verse, My spirit will not always contend with or strive with man. Why would he make such a statement at this point in time. In this, in the context of this passage, this statement means something. What it means is he understands what Hasatan has done. And he is basically saying, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to allow this tainting of the bloodline of the seed of the woman to continue, I'm giving man 120 years and then I'm taking care of business. How many years did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. And then the flood came. So why did the flood come? Was it just because mankind was so bad, so evil? The primary reason why the flood came at that point in time, because I've, I've always wondered this, we're only at, at the point of the flood, we're only 1,656 years into this whole process from when God first created mankind. And you're telling me that in 1656 years, mankind became so wicked and so evil that God had to wipe the whole thing out and start over. That, that has always been hard for me to fathom because I look at just the founding of this nation and how wicked we have become and I'm thinking we're way more wicked than what they were when the flood came. And yet God hasn't destroyed us. So, so what, what was actually going on? Yeah. Did you say it was 1,656 years? From the time that man was created until the flood was 1,656 years. What is going on here is God says, I cannot allow the seed of woman to remain tainted like this because I, I will not be able to bring forth the Messiah 
if it remains this way. And so it is necessary for me to choose a male and a female couple, a woman that has not been tainted to start over with, and then I'm going to have to wipe out the rest. I'm going to have to wipe out this tainted seed from the earth so that it's not an issue anymore. So I don't have to contend with this tainted seed. Okay? Now, I've actually heard people argue that this verse, that the, therefore the lifespan is to be 120 years, that this was somehow the, life, the lifetime of man. You know, in, in, um, elsewhere in the scripture it tells us that we have 70 plus or minus years. Okay? Which would be, if, you're, if you say that this 120 years is talking about a human being's lifespan, that would be in contradiction to the 70 years. Okay? I've also heard people argue that this 120 years is the length of a generation. Well, that, does, that doesn't compute either. Okay? Because gen, a generation has never been 120 years since the beginning of time. It's been 40 years. Okay? Elsewhere in Scripture, a generation is defined as 40 years. Okay? Some argue 70. Okay? But it's not ever 120. So, what God was saying was, in 120 years, I'm going to put an end to this tainted seed. And that's exactly what he did by bringing the flood on the earth. Now I'm going to stop here and we're going to do part two of this particular issue next week because there's enough information just about that particular topic that I can do a whole nother message on and it would quite extend this message if I were to do it today. And so verse 4 is next week what the product, talking about the product of the intermarriage between angels and humans. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha Yisa In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.